Hello, YouTube land. I missed you guys dreadfully. Um, not really. I don't know who any of you are. I'm just kidding. Uh, but I am excited about the opportunity to record again and share with you guys God's word. And uh, also, I got the Misfit Gang kicking it with me again. I'm really pumped to get back into the book of Isaiah. It's been a rough, crazy season. We've been celebrating and uh, taking time off for the holidays. But now we're back. And uh, man, we don't we don't get to go slow into this thing. We're jumping straight in. Because if you don't know, in Isaiah 13, starting in chapter 13 and arguably for the rest of the book, but definitely for the next two chapters, for this chapter and the next chapter, and definitely through chapter 23, we're going to be getting into some pretty heavy prophecy stuff. And, and um, I always want to make sure that as we get into this prophecy, as we begin to dissect this stuff, that everybody would keep on their hearts and their minds the heart of of prophecy because we can get so lost in the intellectual side that we miss out on what it was that we were actually trying to see and sometimes when you look at prophecy and you feel like you figured it out like you understand it then it takes away the majesty of what prophecy is it takes away what prophecy is supposed to move your heart towards God with you feel me so we don't want to do that we want to make sure that when we're looking at prophecy we're looking at it with the proper heart which is to be encouraged at the power of God and the power of Jesus. That's the whole point of prophecy, is to show us that he knows what he's talking about. He's kind of smart. And he's got this. And when it, prophecy is fulfilled, whether it's in our own personal lives or whether it's in God's ultimate plan, it shows that he's bigger than whatever our circumstances are. And it shows that it, us that in this life. And we talked about how prophecy is God's word, Right? Prophecy in and of itself, to speak God's word is to speak a prophetic truth, yeah? It doesn't mean that it's necessarily telling the future. Why is that important? Because we need to know that God's word is true. We need to know that the prophet is true. The prophecy is true. That's what's encouraging. Because if it isn't, then it's not. <laughs> it's not encouraging, and it makes you want to walk away from the faith. So we're going to talk about some pretty amazing things. Isaiah is an amazing person. I'm so glad that the Lord, that he allowed himself to be used with the Lord. And um, we're going to dive into it, man, starting in verse 13. I'm going to pray, or chapter 13. I'm going to pray. My beautiful bride is going to read through the entire of chapter 13. And I'm going to try to make it through the whole chapter. I don't know if I can. There's a lot of stuff in it, but we're going to try. And I, I go on rabbit trails. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much again for this opportunity uh, for the Misfit Gang to come together. And Lord, I just pray as we, as we get into your word, uh, I pray, Father, that we would fall away, myself especially, Lord, that we would fall into the background, Lord, and that the spirit of unity and understanding would come forth, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us, and that if there's anything, God, that's keeping us from, uh, from our minds focusing on you, Lord, whether it's something we're worried about or something that we're stressed about or something we're in fear of or, or just something we really want, something we greatly desire, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just come over us right now, be around us, and help us to focus on the most high thing, which is you. We ask these things and we praise your precious holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right. The oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. On a bare hill, raise a signal. Cry aloud to them. Wave the hand for them to enter the gates of the nobles. I myself have commanded my consecrated ones and have summoned my mighty men to execute my anger, my proudly exulting ones. The sound of a tumult is on the mountains, as of a great multitude. The sound of an uproar of kingdoms, of nations gathering together. The Lord of hosts is mustering a host for battle. They come from a distant land, from the end of the heavens, the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near, as destruction from the Almighty it will come. Therefore, all hands will be feeble, and every human heart will melt. They will be dismayed. Pangs and agony will seize them. They will be in anguish like a woman in labor. 
They will look aghast at one another. Their faces will be aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising, and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. I will make people more rare than fine gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. And like a hunted gazelle or like sheep with none to gather them, each will turn to his own people and each will flee to his own land. Whoever is found will be thrust through and whoever is caught will fall by the sword. Their infants will be dashed in pieces before their eyes. Their houses will be plundered and their wives ravished. Behold, I am stirring up the Medes against them who have no regard for silver and do not delight in gold. Their bows will slaughter the young men. They will have no mercy on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes will not pity children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and pomp of the Chaldeans will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. It will never be inhabited or lived in for all generations. No Arab will pitch his tent there. No shepherds will make their flocks lie down there, but wild animals will lie down there and their houses will be full of howling creatures. There ostriches will dwell and there wild goats will dance. Hyenas will cry in its towers and jackals in the pleasant palaces. Its time is close at hand and its days will not be prolonged. That's heavy, Coach. Whoa. Now, who remembers what 11 and 12 were about? See, we got to use our big kid brains if we're going to be vibing through this. Um, it's lofty stuff, right? We're not drinking milk anymore. We're eating meat. So... Who remembers what chapter 11 was about? No, it derailed us into spiritual gifts, but it was about the aspects of the Holy Spirit, right? What does it mean to have the Holy Spirit upon you, right? And it talked about how the characteristics of somebody who has the Holy Spirit upon them, right? And it was, giving, it was listing off the characteristics of Jesus. Remember, it was prophecy about Jesus coming and the return of the Lord. And I was telling you guys about the difference between the, the rapture and the return of the Lord. They're two separate times, and we were going through all that, right? But this is about Jesus. So chapter 11 was about Jesus. Chapter 12 was about Jesus. So vibe with me real quick. You're a prophet, okay? And the Holy Spirit is revealing a message to you, yeah? And He's showing you the glory of God and the deliverance of His people, Yeah? But then God comes along and says, but wait. I just showed you this great victory. But before we can reach that point, before we can get there, there's some stuff we got to walk through. The Jewish people, right? God's people. Some stuff we got to walk through. Now, at this current time in history, before Isaiah runs off on this tangent in chapter 13, at this current time in history, the Babylonian Empire exists <clears throat> but on the world stage, um, from the world's perspective, it's very small. The Babylonian Empire was not powerful at all. So the idea that Isaiah was actually talking about this great and powerful Babylonian Empire was laughable at the time that he was writing this. As a matter of fact, the Babylonians wouldn't come to invade until over a hundred years after Isaiah had passed away. That's part of the significance of this particular chapter as we get into it. It's a nugget of information that you definitely need. So as he's seeing the Messiah come, as he's seeing the lion lay with the lamb, you guys remember that passage of scripture? We tore it all apart, right? A baby will reach its hands into a brood of vipers and not be bitten, right? This is when Jesus reigns. The Holy Spirit tells him, man, we got some stuff to walk through first. And he's showing them one of the things that they have to walk to. Now, you know that obscure nation that's way, 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 way far away? 
Well, that, that nation called Babylon, I'm going to rise them up. I'm going to build that nation up into a great power for this specific purpose to cast out judgment on my people. But once, I cast that once they cast that judgment, the Babylonians will have their own judgment to deal with. Because, see, the, the judgment that was coming from the Babylonians was motivated out of what? Sin. Pride. Right? Mm -hmm. See, two wrongs don't make a right. And even if you're using an unrighteous deed or an unrighteous thing to get a righteous thing done, that still makes it unrighteous, yeah? So judgment still comes. And that's basically what's being broke down in chapter 13. But there's a lot of language in there, so I just kind of wanted to clear that up real quick. Isaiah's talking about, that would be the equivalent right now of, you know, pick a small splinter sail in the Middle East, you know. And then that would be like Rayleigh coming in today, walking through the doors, and shouting to the top of her lungs to all of us, you know, whatever the small splinter cell, picket, ISIS, anything, you know, they're going to completely annihilate America, take us over, and destroy us. I mean, we would just start laughing. Like, first of all, way over there. <laughs> Second of all, there's like a few thousand of them and millions of us. And third of all, we have the largest military in the world. Are you kidding me, Rayleigh? That is the most ridiculous thing that you've... No. That is the most ridiculous thing that I've ever heard in my entire life, right? That's how we would look at her. That's the equivalent of what Isaiah is saying right now. Maybe not as drastic with the America Al-Qaeda thing, but it's, it's pretty drastic difference, right? The nation of Israel was established. They had trade routes with Egypt. Like, they were, they were established. You get my point. So why, why do we care? Why do we care? This is where we get back to the heart of prophecy. And I'm going to get into these verses, but first I just I need you to vibe with me real quick. Why do we care that Isaiah happened to guess some obscure nation that was very far away from him that eventually would be raised up in power and a hundred years after he died actually end up come in, coming in and cap, uh, captivating the people? Why, why? Why do we care? Because what that means is each and every single day that you're alive, not only is God completely and entirely in control and understands what your situation is in your life now, but He's also in control of it a hundred years from now. So my struggle to trust Him in the moment is laughable. And I know that sounds silly, right? That makes sense, theologically speaking, intellectually speaking. That makes a lot of sense, right? But how much does that intellect help you in the face of something you want or something that's broken your heart, right? A heart's desire of yours that you're unable to obtain or achieve. That knowledge does nothing for you, right? The only thing that does it for you genuinely is experience. Experience with the Lord, yeah? Isaiah was experiencing the Lord. And in that, his faith grew through the roof, and I pray our faith grows as we experience the Lord and understand the depth of what this prophecy is trying to bring to us. So, this Bible says the oracle concerning Babylon. In your Bible, it probably says the burden concerning Babylon. The reason it says burden, and it's translated oracle in my Bible, I actually like burden better, but basically what it means is I have a very heavy message for you. That's what it means. Anytime you read in the Bible and it says, you know, the burden of Assyria or the burden of Babylon, the reason why it's called the burden of Babylon is he says, I have a message for you about this nation Babylon and you're really not going to like it. It's going to be heavy, coach. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not sit down. You need to be sitting down. So basically Isaiah's like, guys, sit down. I need to tell you about Babylon. That, that is a 2022 way to translate verse 1. <laughs> Guys, sit down. i got to tell you about Babylon. It's heavy, man. You're going to want to be sitting down for this. No cap. On a bare hill, raise a signal, cry aloud to them, wave the hand for them to enter the gates of the nobles. I myself have commanded my consecrated ones and have summoned my mighty men to execute my anger, my proudly exulting ones. The sound of the tumult is 
on the mountains of a great multitude, the sound of an uproar of kingdoms, of nations gathering together. The Lord of hosts is mustering for a battle. They come from a distant land. From the end of the heavens, the Lord's weapon of indignation to destroy the whole land. Do you guys, are you vibing with me now? They come from a distant land. Yeah? Kind of gives the chapter more context. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near as destruction from the Almighty. It will come. Now, I, this paused on me. The Holy Spirit spoke this to me. You hear people talk about the day, in this day and age, right? You hear people talk about the day of the Lord all the time, right? The day of the Lord. And people always get real, real excited about it, right? Real excited. I can't wait for Jesus to come back. I'm so excited. Just remember, when Jesus appears in the clouds, he is coming, yes, but he's coming for judgment. Yeah? And so hopefully you aren't there. <laughs> hopefully you're gone already. Because if you're not, that is not a place you want to be. He's not coming with a smile. There's a sword coming out of his mouth. You know what I'm saying? You understand? Not where I want to be. I'm not trying to be involved in that. I'm trying to walk in obedience yeah, now. Dad's getting them in trouble, and I'm just going to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not trying to be around. So, yeah, like when people speak about the day of the Lord, they speak about it as if daddy's coming home with candy and sugar and ice cream. And that's not, no, you cheated on the test and you used your phone in school and he found out about it. He's not coming home with candy and sugar and ice cream. He's coming home with a wooden paddle. You know what I'm saying? It's about to go down. Yeah, it's problems, big problems. Anyway, so... <laughs> and, and this is another thing, too, to consider. When you, when you go into the presence of the Lord, this is why it's important, A, to be humble, right? To humble your heart. Because there's a big push in this culture today, and, 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 and I understand it. We need to understand that, that, that God is our friend and that He cares. The Holy Spirit is called the Comforter. I understand that. Okay, I understand that intimately. But everybody loves to just throw out the passage of Scripture where it also mentions to fear the Lord for who He is. You understand? We need to fear God for who He is. He's not one to be played with. When He says something, you should listen. He kind of allows you to breathe. You know what I mean? We should fear the Lord. He's not one to be played with. And this is the message that, but see, Isaiah understood this intimately. He knew who God was, and he knew what God was going to do. And God is flexing his power at this moment, in this time, in this passage. He's saying, he's saying, listen, there's going to be this far-off nation. They're not coming right away, but they are coming. And I'm raising them up, mighty men, mighty men. And he wants, he's trying to warn the people. Isaiah's trying to warn the people. He's trying to encourage them to repent. He's trying to encourage them. He's like, guys, you don't understand. You don't understand. I know it's not happening right now, but there's this nation that I saw through the Spirit of the Lord, and they're being raised up. And these guys, they're nothing to play with. It says, Therefore all hands will be feeble, and every human heart will melt. Because the judgment of the Lord is coming. They will be dismayed. Pangs and agony will seize them. They will be in anguish like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at one another. Their faces will be aflame in shock, in horror, right? They're in fright. They're terrified. These people are going to come through with such a viciousness. They're going to come through with such aggression that they're like, you're literally just going to stand there and be shocked as you watch them bust through the gates. He's trying to warn them. He's like, I'm telling you guys, it's going to be bad. Behold, the day of the Lord comes cruel with wrath and fierce anger to make the land a desolation and destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark and it's rising and the moon will not shed light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. See, this is why, guys, I always encourage you so much 
to understand the uh, intimate details in the Bible about what it says about sin. Do you guys remember me telling you about that? About, it's an archery term. It means to miss the mark. Mm -hmm. But then there's another word, sin, in the Bible, and it doesn't mean that term. It means to trespass. That means you didn't try to shoot the target. You just broke it over your knee and walked away. Okay? This is important to understand because the, the sin that God is coming to judge in this instance is not the sin. That's who Jesus came for. Jesus came for the people who were shooting at the target and couldn't hit it to save their lives, literally. Jesus came for those people. He came to save the lost, right? God's coming to judge the people who saw the target, knew the way, knew what was expected of them, understood righteous intimately, and said no. The pompous, the proud, yeah? The people who don't sin. The people who don't sin because they never tried, right? It's a good way to look at that. I like that I just said that. They never tried. <laughs> they never even tried, yeah? Pompous pride. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. I will make people more rare than fine gold and mankind like gold of Ophir, which is a, obviously a very rare type of gold. But the point is, the, <laughs> he's going to reduce the population of the earth so drastically. This sounds reminiscent of another passage of Scripture in Revelations. Good job. Revelations, right? Yeah, when the judgment comes, right? The third of the earth is destroyed. He's going to completely ravish the population of the earth or the population of the earth will be completely ravished. That's a better way to say it. Remember I talked about the wrath of God is not so much God ensuing wrath because wrath is not a part of God, but it's more so God removing his presence mm -hmm. and wrath takes place. <laughs> exactly. Good job, kid. It's so rough, man. I, I have a hard time even reading these next few passages. I will make people more rare than fine gold and mankind like the gold of uh, Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. Now, a lot of this makes a lot of sense. Think about it. He just said that the stars won't give off light, the moon won't give light in the evening, and that the sun will be very dim. And here he's saying that he's going to actually literally move the earth from its place. Now, you guys understand, because you're all very smart kids, about how dependent the earth is on its place, right? The entirety of our ego, the reason life exists is because of what some people believe, a very a uh, happy accident that happened when an explosion happened millions of years ago by who caused it, we don't know. But yeah, just we just so happened to land in this perfect position that gave us life, right? <laughs> That's great. So... <laughs> If you believe that, you got more faith than I do. Um, but my point, my point is, uh, and you also understand that the earth is on a 23.5 degree tilt, yeah? So if the earth is even slightly moved out of its place, you drastically change the atmosphere, temperature, Tide. and life that's able to exist, correct? Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and the day of the Lord's fierce anger. And like hunted gazelle or like sheep with none to gather them, each will turn to his own people and each will flee for his own land. And whoever is found will be thrust through and whoever is caught will fall by the sword. Their infants will be dashed in pieces before their eyes. Their houses will be plundered and their wives ravished. Behold, I am stirring up the meads against them and have no regard for silver and do not delight in gold. Their bows will slaughter. You guys ever seen the movie Batman? No. Yes. No? No, never seen it? <laughs> you, you, seen the one, you seen the one with the Dark Knight? Yeah. The Dark Knight? Yeah. Well, there's this scene, there's this scene, there's this scene in there, right? And they're, they're referencing the Joker. And basically what they say is, um, they, uh, Alfred is speaking to Bruce Wayne. And Bruce was trying to figure out 
where the Joker was going to be next. He's a detective. He's very logical. You know, he's trying to figure out what is this, how does this guy operate so that I can figure out his next step. And so Alfred tells him the story of a, uh, a madman and a tribe that they were working towards in Africa. And basically this man was breaking into all these cities, stealing all the jewelry, right, all the gold and diamonds, and then he would just drive around town to town and throw the diamonds out the window and hand them off to random people. And then he explained to Bruce Wayne something that the Bible is teaching us right here. <laughs> Some people just want to watch the world burn. Pure evil, pure chaos. We talked about how the world is controlled by these forces, right? Order and chaos, entropy, right? Order and chaos. Some things are pure evil, pure chaos. There is no order to them. There's just evil. They just want to see things destroyed. And they don't care how much gold you have. And they don't care how much silver you have. And they don't care what you can offer them. All they want to do is evil. Evil. And that's what he's saying the Medes will be raised up to do. The bows slaughter the young men and they will have no mercy on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes will not pity children. It's one of the areas that I've noticed the heart of our country, and I have to say this because I'm a youth pastor and I'm here. Uh, this is one of the biggest areas that I've noticed the heart of our country becoming more and more calloused and more and more evil is when it regards to children. We've taken this concept of innocence and we've thrown it out of the window and we've made it disgusting and unwanted in our culture. Innocence used to be the epitome of what was beautiful. It was why people love dogs so much, right? Because they're innocent. What could a dog, what could the motivations of a dog be that could be so evil? It's a dog. And that was the reason why babies are so beloved, right? They're innocent. They're pure. They're not to be touched, not to be tainted. One of the saddest days for most parents is the days that they have to tell their kid that Santa Claus isn't real, right? <laughs> I know, we don't rock like that, but for a lot of parents, that was it, right? So my point is, there's a beauty in innocence, or at least there used to be. There used to be. There used to be a beauty in innocence. And there's something that's growing in our culture today where child porn is on an all-time rise. Pedophilia is now becoming normalized in our culture and accepted as a sexual preference rather than something that's just purely demonic. It's growing in this culture that you're growing up in, innocence is being robbed. And it's being looked at with, and it, what they're doing is devaluing it. They're devaluing everything. They're destroying the moral system and devaluing young lives. And as a youth pastor, I can't stand it. It's disingenuous. They're liars. They're all liars, and I can't stand it. You all are incredibly valued. And, and your innocence and purity, your lack of disgusting things, your lack of mire that you let yourself get in is a blessing to my heart, especially for somebody who is very dirty for a long time. I know the beauty of innocence. I know it because I know what it is to lose it. It's beautiful and it should be protected at all costs, like a precious treasure. And yet, as the world ends, this is where we'll be. Children will be of nothing. Nothing sacred. Wives are ravished. Nothing sacred. In Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms and the splendor of the pomp of the Chaldeans will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. It will never be inhabited or lived in for all generations. No Arab will pitch his tent there. No shepherds will make their flock and lie down there. But wild animals will lie down there. And their houses will be full of hallowing creatures. Their ostriches will dwell. And there will be wild goats will dance. Hyenas will cry in its towers and jackals and peasants. And its time is close at hand and the days will not be prolonged. Now, um, I don't know if you guys have ever... Um, I don't know if you're as into archaeology as I am. Um, but you can find a lot of the ruins of uh, ancient Babylon. They're uninhabited. Mm -hmm. Desert place. You understand what I'm saying? This is an old, old book. 
Still true. Old book, still true. Now, that's not true for the entirety of the kingdom of Babylon, but there is many portions of the kingdom of Babylon, and if I had to venture a guess, I would say the portions that were spoken about when Isaiah let this out of his mouth that are still unhabitable till this day. Mm -hmm. um, I know that was a harsh message, but what I want you to take away from it, what I'm praying you take away from it, is A, let's stop playing around with God. Yeah? For multiple reasons. It's bigger than a hedonistic, it's, it, it's bigger than fighting off your selfish desires. Okay? It's bigger than that. It's bigger than being a happier person because you make sacrifices, right? Because that's an easy concept for anybody to understand. Anytime you go to work, you're sacrificing your time for money. Make sense? We get that. I want us to understand, I, I pray that we understand that the reason why God can come off so scary sometimes is because it's really that serious. It's really that serious. Sin is really that serious. Obedience to Him is really that serious. And I'm not talking about obedience from the sense of, because we're liberated in the Holy Spirit, I'm not talking about obedience in the sense of we follow some you know, fascist czar who's going to beat us with a stick if we don't walk in line. That's not the heart of it at all. But what he, it's the heart of a father saying, listen, man, if you do that, it's going to hurt, and it might kill you, and I don't want you to, and I love you, hmm. but this is going to kill you. That's a father saying it to his kids, and he might even say it sternly, but he means it, and his heart is to save us. His heart is to save us because we will destroy ourselves. If you don't believe me, just look at history. We're really, really good at it. Really good at it. We can destroy ourselves quickly. Rome fell from within. From within. Not from an outside power, not but from somebody taking it over, but it fell from within. When we get more into Isaiah and prophecy, you'll understand why that's such a profound statement. But anyway... Um, I hope you guys are encouraged through this, man, and I hope that we can take our relationship with God and our obedience to God seriously, right? God puts up fences around us because there are wolves outside, yeah? And, and the fences aren't there to hurt us or hinder us. They're there to teach us what we shouldn't dabble in and what we should. And also, don't forget that this harsh message started with Jesus. You guys remember that? And all this latter portion of Isaiah, this latter portion right here is, is him talking about being outside the presence of Jesus. Hey, yep. Let's be inside the presence of Jesus. If I'm going to fight, I'm going to fight with him. Yeah? Okay. All right, man. Well, that's all we got for today. And uh, I really got, I, it's been a long time. If you could, I'd really like you to belt out with me. To everybody in YouTube land. <laughs> We say goodbye from the Misfix gang with love, love peace, peace, and chicken, chicken grease. grease.